people cry for all different reasons. Often, of course, people cry when they're sad. Some people cry when they're angry. Some people cry when they're happy. Sometimes we cry for things that have happened in the past. Sometimes we're crying about the present moment experience. And sometimes we even cry about something we're worried about or sad about that may occur in the future. There are a few instances of crying in this week's Parsha and Parsha Svayigash. It's a very emotion-filled Parsha, family that's been split apart is now reuniting. There's tears at the beginning of the Parsha, there's tears in the middle of the Parsha, and the Parsha ends as well with some more crying. I want to focus and analyze one instance of crying in this week's Parsha, a reunification of a very special relationship. And I think the tears that are shed can give a lot of insight into what's happening in a deeper level at this particular moment. Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. They're all understandably nervous, anxious, scared, even stunned. He tells them, no, 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 come close. It's okay. Hashem sent me here. But then he has one special moment with his one and only full brother from both his mother and his father as he embraces his younger brother, Binyamin. The Torah tells us in Perek Memhei Pasuk Yud Dalit Parshas Vayigash, Vayipol al Tzavarei Vinyamin Achiv Vayevk. And Yosef falls onto the neck of his brother Binyamin and he cries. Ubinyamin Bacha al Tzavarav. And Binyamin cries on the neck of Yosef. Very understandable, makes perfect sense. Two brothers who haven't seen each other in 22 years. Last time Yosef saw Binyamin, he was probably just a little boy. Probably never imagined they would see each other again. Their only full brother. Now they're back together. They hug. They embrace. Tears are shed. And they're both crying on each other's shoulders. If I would freeze phrase that for a, freeze frame that for a moment, what are they crying about? If we can just define it. Presumably they're crying about the present moment. They're crying tears of joy. Of excitement. Of, of, of happiness, of simcha. They're back together, two brothers reunited. Perhaps as well, there's mixed in some tears of pain and sadness of the past, of years gone by that can never come back, of not growing up together, of not really knowing each other, of not having met each other's families, 22 years, brothers with no contact at all. And yet Rashi takes this crying into a whole different direction. Not about the past, not about the present, not even about their emotion of coming back together or being split apart. Rashi says something that seemingly comes out of left field. Rashi says, Vayipol al tzavarei binyamin achiv vayev, and Yosef falls onto his brother Binyamin's neck and cries, al shnei miktashos, shahasidin liyos bechelko shal binyamin, Yosef was crying over the destruction of the two future temples, the Batei Mikdash, that would reside in the portion of Binyamin. We know Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, was divided into different portions, divided among the 12 tribes. Binyamin's portion is the one that contained within it the base of Mikdash, the first and the second. Both would be built. Both, of course, unfortunately, tragically, would be destroyed. And Yosef is crying over the fact that the Bate Mikdash in the future, centuries from now, will be destroyed, those Bate Mikdash that reside in the portion of Binyamin. And likewise, Rashi continues with Binyamin Bacha al Tzavarav, and Binyamin is crying on the neck of Yosef, al Mishkan Shiloh, Sha'asid li Yos Bechelko Shal Yosef, Vesofo Lei Charev. Over the Mishkan, the tabernacle that would reside at least for many years in the city of Shiloh, which was in the portion of Yosef, and also one day would be no longer. Seems to really be out of the blue. It's a little bit of a funny interpretation. I mean, the puzzle doesn't really seem to need much explanation. The crying that we read about is very simply and readily understood. We understand why Yosef is crying and why Binyamin are crying. It makes perfect sense. Why is Rashi bringing the Beis HaMikdash and the Mishkan, the destruction, centuries, generations from now, deep into the future? Why is that relevant in this particular story? Now, on a technical note, the Medrash, which is actually the source for Rashi, explains a question that prompts this answer. 
the problem that the Medrash has with this Pasuk is in the word Tzavare. It says that Yosef falls onto the neck of Binyamin. The Hebrew word for neck is Tzavar. The problem is it says Tzavare Binyamin, and Tzavare is actually in plural. So literally it should be translated as Yosef falls onto the necks of Binyamin. The Medrash asks, <laughs> How many necks did Binyamin have? Why would the Torah be saying Yosef fell onto his necks? It's, a, it's almost asking it, um, you know, sarcastically. Obviously, Binyamin only had one neck. Rather, there must be some other alternative, deeper message here that the neck is referring to the Beis HaMikdash. That uh, Yosef didn't just fall on Binyamin's neck, but somehow the neck symbolizes the Beis HaMikdash. In fact, some of the Mephoshim point out that in Shira Shira in Perek Dalit, Shlomo Melech says, Kimigdal David Tzavareich. The great tower of David, a reference to the base of Mikdash, is like your neck. So there is some symbolism connecting the base of Mikdash and the neck. Perhaps because the neck is at the top of our body, just like the base of Mikdash is at the top of the mountain in Yerushalayim. Perhaps because the neck holds upon it our head, the most important part of our body that has our, our thoughts and our mind. Maybe it's like the base of Mikdash that contains within it the, the Shechina of Hashem and connect that to our body, which is like B'nai Yisrael. There's lots of different explanations and symbolisms, but suffice it to say that the Medrash finds in our Pasuk a hint of the Beis HaMikdash from this word Savare, literally translated as necks. By the way, parenthetically, the Nitziv doesn't quote the Medrash, but is struggling with the same question. Why does it say Tzavare Binyamin, that Yosef fell on Binyamin's necks? He explains that in Hebrew, actually, each side of the neck is considered to be its own word. He says we actually have another word for neck, which is oref. We know B'nai Yisrael are referred to as an Am Kishay Oref, a stubborn people, but literally Am Kishay Oref means a stiff-necked nation, because Oref is the back of your neck. When you're stubborn, you turn your head on something, you show them the back of your neck. So the back of our neck is called the Oref. The sides are each called the Tzavar. So the Nitziv says that Yosef actually gave Binyamin, you know, one of those kisses where you do one side and then the other side, kiss both sides of his neck. So when it says, by you pull out Tzavar Binyamin, he literally fell on both of his necks. On the right side of his neck and the left side of his neck, the Nitzim says this demonstrates an uh, extra level of Ahava, an extra love and connection that he gave him this double kiss on both sides of his neck. That aside, the Medrash's answer is that, no, 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 the word Savare, even though literally translated as next, here is a reference to, symbolically refers to the Beis HaMikdash, Yosef fell on Binyamin's necks, crying over the two necks, the two Bate Mikdash, the two temples that would be destroyed. We all agree, though, it still needs some more explanation. I mean, again, the base of Mikdash is centuries from even being built. Forget about being destroyed. The second one's still over a millennium away. And that's what they're crying about at this moment? They haven't seen each other for 22 years? It almost seems weird or inappropriate that Yosef is thinking about the base of Mikdash. Give your brother a hug first. Benjamin's thinking about the Mishkan. You haven't seen Yosef in 22 years. What's going on here? I was thinking about it, I want to suggest a very simple answer. At least I think so. Here's why Yosef and Binyamin are thinking about the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash at this emotional moment. They are experiencing right now the devastating consequences of Sinas Chinam. Of what can happen and what the ramifications are when brothers can't get along when there is hatred and lack of peace among brothers. This family, Yaakov's children, Yosef and his brothers, have experienced in their own miniature form, or not so miniature, their own gullus, their own exile, their own separation, their own, their own brokenness, their own destruction of this family to the extent that brothers almost killed one of their own threw him in a pit where he very well could have been killed, decided to spare his life but sold him down to Egypt, assuming that they would probably never see him again. They lied to their father. That's how angry they were. That's how deep this hatred went. And now in this moment, luckily almost, it's miraculously, there's a geula, there's a redemption, the family's back together, something that none of them ever could have dreamed of happening. That's what Yaakov says. I never dreamed that this would ever happen again, that I'd ever see my son. And here they are. You could imagine at this moment, Yosef and Binyamin, and probably all the brothers, but we're focused on those two, 
right now especially, are thinking that I hope and pray that no one will ever have to experience this again. That no one will ever have such deep hatred for their brothers. That there will never be such a lack of shalom, of peace, of care, of support, of concern for literal brothers among each other so that we can avoid any form of this destruction and devastation again. The problem is that Yosef and Benjamin knew better. Through prophecy or somehow they understood that uh, the challenge, the difficulty of sinas chinam, of baseless hatred, was not ending now. It would be a plague. It would be a problem that would stick with us for generations. And in fact, it would have devastating consequences, not just on a personal or familial level, but on a national level. It would lead to the destructions of our Mishkan, of our Bate Mikdash. They understood right now, more than ever, the devastating power of Sinas Chinam, and they foresaw into the future what was going to happen. And they cried. I'm sure they were also crying over the fact of the sadness of their separation for 22 years. I'm sure they were also crying over the gula, the redemption, the reunification, the joy of being together again. And also built upon those two crimes, they were also crying for their future, for their children and their grandchildren and their descendants who would experience maybe in its own way and in slightly different circumstances. But this other form of galus and gula, of exile that comes from a lack of peace among brothers and then God willing, hopefully soon, someday, the geula, the redemption. But you can never make up for the lost time. So we'll celebrate when it happens, but we've lost so much. But I want to ask one more question. You know, whose fault was it? There are so many different players in this story. How did it get to this? Who is to blame? Some might say that uh, Yaakov should shoulder some of the blame. Showed favoritism to one of his sons. He bought a special multicolored coat for Yosef and not for his others. Some might even place some of the blame on Yaakov's wives. They were certainly put in a very tough situation, but maybe they never made peace with each other fully enough. And maybe the tension and the fighting between them trickled down to the next generation, and that's what caused these sects and these groups among their sons. Some might place some of the blame on Yosef. Rashi says he's always fixing his hair to look nice. He's telling them about his dreams. Maybe there was a little bit on his own level, Yosef at Sadiq. Maybe there was a little bit of arrogance or haughtiness in the way he carried himself. Certainly some of the blame belongs, maybe much of the blame belongs with the brothers who seem to overreact. And even if they were justified in being upset, but again, what they did has no uh, justification to throw your brother into a pit and then sell him down to Egypt. The answer is that I don't think the question is even really an appropriate question. When there is lack of shalom between people or between peoples, we don't ask the question, whose fault is it or who's to blame? If you're asking that question, that's already part of the problem. I'll give you an example or a proof of what I mean. We mentioned before that the base of Mikdash, the temples would ultimately be in the portion of Binyamin. That's of course true. That's why Rashi says it. But the truth is that the base of Mikdash was split among the portions of Binyamin and also Yehuda. The boundary line separating the portions of Binyamin and Yehuda actually went right through the base of Mikdash. In fact, it went right next to the Mizbeach. In other words, the Mizbeach was right on the boundary between the portions of Binyamin and Yehuda. And the reason it was outlined as such, the Medrash says, is because it had to be, the boundaries had to be arranged that the Mizbeach, one of the primary parts of the Beis HaMikdash, where the services of the Karbanos took place, had to be in the portion of Binyamin. Why did the Mizbeach have to be in the portion of Binyamin? The Medrash says because Binyamin is the only one of the brothers who wasn't involved in Mechiras Yosef, in the selling of Yosef, and we want the Mizbeach, where the Karbanos are going to be brought on a daily basis, to be completely removed and unconnected to that terrible sin of brothers not being able to get along. In fact, if you look uh, in this week's Parsha, Parsha's Vayichi, Perek Memtes, Pasuk Chav Zayin, check it out on your own if you want, read the Pasuk, read Unculus there, and you'll see a beautiful hint and a description of the fact that one of Binyamin's legacies 
is going to be the fact that Korbanos are going to be offered on the Mizbeach that resides in the base of Mikdash, specifically Davka in his portion. If you want to talk about it more later, uh, check it out and come talk to me. Anyway, some of the Mepharshim on that Medrash ask, hold on a second. I understand that the Mizbeach can't be in the portion of Ruvain or Shimon or Yisachar or God or Asher. They were all guilty. They were all involved on their own level in Mechiras Yosef, in selling Yosef. But why couldn't the Mizbeach be in the portion of Yosef? Wasn't he innocent? He wasn't involved in selling his brother. He was the victim. Why is the only option for the Mizbeach to be in the portion of Binyamin? Maybe it could have been in the portion of Yosef. And the Mepharshim answer that Binyamin is truly the only brother who was not involved at all. He wasn't there. He was a little boy. He wasn't a part of it. Even Yosef, although his main role in the story was that of a victim, if you're part of the relationship, that is a relationship of sin, of hatred, of disconnect, of fighting, then you're part of the issue. You Then you're connected to the problem. No one is completely blameless or innocent when people can't get along. The fact that the Torah tells us, Lo shalom, that Yosef's brothers couldn't even talk to him civilly or peacefully, that's a reflection on Yosef's brothers, and that's a reflection on Yosef himself. Whose fault was it? Yaakov, the wives, Yosef, the brothers? The answer is everybody's. If we can't get along, then we are all to blame. I mean, how often do you think about somebody or some group of people who you don't get along with so well? And we instinctively say to ourselves, well, I'm ready to get along with them. I would respect them. I can tolerate them. If they would just treat me nicer, they'd be interested in a relationship. I'm open. Sure. It's their fault. They're the ones who aren't interested. They're the ones who aren't respectful. They're the ones who don't treat me nicely. Firstly, if you're thinking that, it's probably likely that they're thinking that about you too. But also, if you're thinking that, then that's not enough. Then you, too, are a part of the problem. It's our responsibility to take the initiative, not just to be receptive to shalom, to peace when it falls in our lap, but to pursue peace, to be a rodev shalom, to be somebody who doesn't avoid the problem, but fixes the problem. That's what we can learn from the story of Yosef, his brothers, and their family. This issue of sinas chinam, of brothers, and in this case, and in this story, it's literal, physical, biological brothers. Okay, today maybe we're, you know, we're cousins, we're second cousins. We've grown, thank God. Our people is not just one little nuclear family anymore, but we're all brothers, brothers and sisters. And this challenge is an age-old one. It is a timeless struggle. And Yosef and Binyamin are probably still crying over the fact that we still can't get along. And now not only has the base of Mikdash been destroyed, but it's remained destroyed, and it hasn't been rebuilt for 2,000 years. Which means the problem that caused it to be destroyed still is alive and well. But it also gives us the key. It reminds us of what we need to do, of what's more important perhaps than anything else. The message from this Parsha, above all, is that brothers need to get along. And when they do, the tears will stop and the base of Mikdash will be rebuilt. Have a wonderful, peaceful, happy week.